Please. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody where you are from. My name is Ying Li, and I'm excited to welcome our audience and the speakers to the NICE IEEE UK and Ireland Women in Engineering Ambassador Program Early Career Talk. I'm the co-host today. Firstly, I would like to invite the host, Dr. Nagam Sai, to open this webinar for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. I'm Dr. Nagam Saeed, the IEEE Women in Engineering, United Kingdom and Ireland Chair, the Early We uh, Profession Lead and the Ambassador Network Lead. Our activities aim to promote women in technology as well as create a culture of diversity and inclusion. We work together to improve early profession outreach. We want to reach out to engineering and computing undergraduate and postgraduate students and support them as much as we can. I would like to welcome and thank everyone for joining the ninth Early Career Talks webinar organized by the Ambassadors team. A warm welcome to our speakers and our audience from all over the world. This is a unique experience to witness four different talks about uh, the recent development in technology and research. Today's talks tackle different technical subjects, argument reality, intelligent service, and energy efficient and computer vision. I'm looking forward to listening to today's talks and discussion. Back to you, Dr. Ying. Thank you very much, Nathan. Let me show the agenda for today's event. Today we have four wonderful talks, and after that, Dr. Nakam will also share some IEEE Women Engineering Award opportunities with us. I would like to mention that the presentation recording for today will be broadcast on IEEE UK and Ireland section website and the IEEE Women in Engineering UK and Ireland Ambassadors YouTube channel. Before we start the talk, here are some housekeeping notes. You will notice that you are muted and that you can't use the camera. After each presentation, the audience will have the opportunity to ask their questions and the presenters will answer it. If you have questions that occur to you during the talk and you don't want to lose track of, please do type them into our Q&A chat box and we can address those at the end. As we have four speakers today, the, to target the question to the right speaker, the audience is suggested that you write the speaker's name or their talk order with the question. Thank you very much. After the talk, we also have a survey. Please don't forget to fill it to help us deliver better webinars in the future. And please also provide your email in the form and we can send you your e-certificate for this event within four days. Now let's enjoy the talk. I will hand over to the first speaker, Dr. Yana Skonyuskaya. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. I would like to start my talk by with saying a big thank you to the organizers and what I think it's a great opportunity this is to speak to you today and be able to present during the IEEE Women in Engineering Ambassadors Network. I think this is a great start to start a conversation between everyone and an open dialogue. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Please let me share my screen. Yeah, thank you, Jenna. Okay, so um, the talk, um, I hope you can see um, the presentation now. Um, yeah, um, it's okay. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so what, um, what my team um, is working on is called augmented reality, ultra high definition, colored computer generated holograms. And we work on a specific area. It is for safety applications in uh, automotive head up displays and as an immersive experience. And I would like to um, present this talk in an accessible and inclusive way and start a dialogue. And of course, we'll welcome any questions. Thank you. First, about myself and my team. Currently, I am a 30 PhD student in um, the CMMP group at the University of Cambridge with Professor Tim Wilkinson. 
And we are using 3D holography to increase the interconnectedness of our society, to make an immersive experience in every team and create cross-disciplinary research. Um, currently, I work together with the UCL and the University of Oxford to promote this dialogue and um, exchange ideas in between universities, and we also hope to increase our collaborations further. Regarding what is actually augmented and virtual reality, most of us would probably see it as an immersive virtual world. Um, of course, there are many and had up this place and had mounted this place to show the virtual experience. But what we are currently doing is that we try to mix the two together and create the mixed reality applications to challenge current uh, research opportunities and create more inclusive ways of combining the best of world of the both worlds together. Please let me show you how. Our proposed approach for augmented reality head up displays in cars is moving from the current solutions of the car head up displays from a small area of the windshield or a small device to actually in eye projections that the virtual objects will be aligned with real objects to enhance the safety while driving. This is our vision of an inclusive augmented reality product display. Further, our objectives are using LiDAR data from currently we operate with um, UCL and scan Mallet Street in London. We process the point cloud data in 3D and cut out the objects so that they represent the obstacles which we saw by scanning re in real time the streets and projecting them into the driver's field of view is an inclusive and alerting way to communicate with the driver without distracting him. This shows our collaboration with UCL when we scanned with a LIDAR, uh, terrestrial LIDAR scanner, Mallet Street at 10 a.m. Uh, the data is made out of point clouds, so we can utilize a three-dimensional object and rotate it in any direction to alert the driver of the full dimensions of all obstacles. There are different methods of combining augmented reality into head-up displays. Um, first, there are real-time uh, processing methods, which we utilize currently based on points. So we process that every point has its own intensity and we process point by point so that the data we obtain is accurate and we can monitor every point to be in different brightness so that we also have the depth experience in the field of view. Our optical setup consists of the helium neon laser, polarizers, virtual lenses and optical lenses, a 4K special light modulator, and the laser beam is directly beamed into the viewer's eyes so that the objects appear directly floating as 3D virtual objects. We calibrate and process our images in a different manner because we also utilize virtual lenses to place the objects to align them with real life objects in the distance and size. These are some examples of some mixed reality results so that we show how we can actually place virtual objects and align them with real objects to create a natural experience of our real life combined with virtual reality. What, uh, what I mean when I talk about inclusive holographic LiDAR projections is that we can project it, the laser light and the LiDAR data in any color. We can create a colorful experience, but we could also project in a specific um, enhanced, uh, with a, a specific enhanced light source 
to, for example, adjust it and make it a personalizable to the driver specifications. For example, who have um, red or green deficiency, we can really adjust our results and make them personalized for everyone. Some results I would like to share, which we have with our red, green, and blue fiber lasers. These can enhance the natural viewing perception. And we are using also these specters to make the data more accurate in the field of view so that it, it creates this natural viewing experience. In conclusion, to really combine every, uh, everything I, I would like to bring across today is that we try to create augmented reality, use it as a tool to create a natural experience. We don't want to replace the driver, we just want to enhance the safety of the driving experience. And this is just one proposal for utilizing augmented reality in an inclusive and accessible way. We are very open for collaborations, for ideas, and cross-disciplinary work to work together to enhance current applications in holography and optics to optimize and personalize solutions for everyday use. I will welcome any questions and thank you so so much for taking your time to listening uh, back to back to you thank you so much Yang, you are muted dr Yang, you are muted Oh, sorry. Thank you, Jenna. Sorry. 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 Thank you for your interesting presentation. It's very mm -hmm. impressive topic. And uh, here we got a question about the collaboration you mentioned. It's about uh, what potential cross-departmental collaborations are you looking for? And uh, how could the collaborations enhance your research? Thank you so much for this question. I think this is a great question because as I learned through starting the PhD and now coming um, along the way, I think it is a journey and it is definitely teamwork because um, I had an idea of how to enhance current head-up displays for cars, but the collaborations really made it so interesting and so diverse and inclusive. And I would love to expand the collaborations because now from UCL, we learn how to obtain personalized LIDAR data. Um, with uh, the University of Oxford, we um, develop um, uh, algorithms together in an inclusive way and enhance them and make them more um, strong. I would really like to expand collaborations also with social scientists to see what are actually the physiological and psychological impacts, what virtual reality applications and holography can do and how it should be utilized in an ethical way. So these are just some thoughts of how uh, we can expand current collaborations. I, I would love to work together with all scientists who are interested. Thank you so much for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Um, another question is about the virtual reality headsets you mentioned. Uh, what is the advantage of mixed reality applications compared to the uh, virtual reality headsets? Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. I think um, by just judging when I have um, compared the two slides, what current applications have, if it's a head-mounted display, or if it's on a small area of the windshield, it could be that the viewer receives information only in a certain way, but has no choice than accepting this way of reality. But it might not be the way the viewer is used to perceive reality. It might not be inclusive. 
and we don't have the dialogue between the viewer and the method of how it's implemented. What had head up displays do and what our augmented reality head up displays allow us to do is that we create personalized applications based on the user's needs. And uh, I think this is the most important step when creating this technology that it's open to the user's needs. Whereas other technologies are developed already in a in a systematic way with already implemented um, borders. So I think um, it's always important to ask the users their opinions and um, and enhance the application. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here we have another question. Is uh, uh, can your research contribute to road-based community policing approaches? What do you think about this? Thank you. I think this is a great question. Um, I think absolutely. If I if if I may expand this question, I think um, really not only this research, I think every research is about a dialogue and trying. And that's why I think it is so important of um, yeah. hearing from multiple sides uh, to see how actually the yeah. research is perceived by, by multiple people. That's why I think it is so important to to ask questions and never to stop actually looking for more answers and expanding the research question. So I think the impact can be always based upon the initial question, but should be questioned always within the way of how how it could be optimized further. If yeah, that thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so, yep. No questions for now. Is there any other questions for Jenna? Yeah, I think that's okay. Yeah. Let's hand over to the second speaker. Welcome, Dr. Lina Mojad. Thank you, Ying Li. Uh, let me try and um, share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yeah. Let's Excellent. Uh, so first of all, let me start by thanking the IEEE Women in Engineering UK and I, especially the Ambassadors Program, which is I am a member of. Uh, today I am uh, sitting on the other side of the table because usually I support in co-hosting this event, but it is my pleasure to uh, provide this talk today uh, as a speaker. Uh, and um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Naram and Yingli for inviting me to present my work on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces for green wireless communications. Uh, before I start talking about my research, I'd like to give a brief introduction about myself. So I'm a lecturer in autonomous systems and connectivity at the um, James Watt School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow. I'm also a lecturer at the joint educational program in Glasgow College UESTC with China and a member of the communication sensing and um, imaging hub. I finished my PhD in electrical and electronics engineering uh, from the University of uh, Surrey um, uh, in the UK back in 2018. Um, um, and I joined uh, as a lecturer in 2020 as part of this joint educational program. Uh, my research interests uh, span uh, the broad area of beyond 5G wireless technologies, but I'm all particularly interested in green and sustainable uh, wireless technologies, such as reconfigurable intelligent services, which is the topic of today's talk, and also wireless power transfer. However, I do work on uh, other topics such as integrated space aerial terrestrial networks, as well as hybrid RF and optical wireless communication systems. I particularly look at performance modeling and physical layer optimization relevant to those technologies. Um, uh, uh, as far as my volunteering uh, service is concerned, I'm an IEEE senior member and I'm also an IEEE Women in Engineering member. I'm part of the Women in Engineering UK and I ambassadors program. 
Uh, I'm also a board member of the IEEE UK and Ireland Communication Society chapter. Um, I also, um, I'm also an associate editor in several IEEE journals and a fellow of the Women's Engineering uh, Society. Uh, my research collaborations um, uh, are uh, the fruit of successful engagements with uh, industry and academic institutions from around uh, the globe, from the UK, from USA, Canada, France, UAE, Greece, China, and Finland, uh, to mention a few. So moving to today's uh, presentation, today uh, I'm going to provide uh, a motivation on, uh, the, on, the, on the technology. So I'm going to start with a perspective on beyond 5G and 6G, and then I'll talk about the technology of reconfigurable intelligence surfaces as a new frontier in wireless systems. And I will reflect on some of its potential applications um, uh, in 6G uh, uh, systems, and I will also provide an overview uh, of the results uh, from our research studies relevant to this topic. So uh, to give some motivation about, um, uh, about, about the technology, I'd like to reflect back on, uh, on 5G use cases. In this sense, the 5G wireless uh, networks have been identified as the backbone of emerging um, Internet of Everything services and prominently support three use cases, which are the enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable and low latency communications and massive machine type communications. Uh, these services are rate and data oriented. They are heterogeneous in nature and defined by a diverse set of key performance indicators, therefore enabling them through a single platform uh, while meeting uh, their stringent requirements simultaneously in terms of data rate, reliability, and latency is a challenging task. However, there is a big vision for 6G wireless systems uh, in 2030 and beyond, which are either driven by the applications such as multisensory um, extended reality, connected robotics and autonomous systems, wireless brain computer interactions, and so on. Uh, these are also associated with some driving trends such as um, uh, from spatial to volumetric spectral and energy efficiency, the emergence of smart surfaces and environments, which, which I'm going to uh, highlight today. Uh, there's also a trend of having a massive availability of small data and so on. And all of these trends and applications will be enabled by some revolutionary technologies, uh, such as above six uh, gigahertz for 6G uh, communications, transceivers with integrated frequency bands, uh, communication with large intelligence surfaces, and uh, the availability of edge uh, AI amongst the others. Uh, however, there is a dilemma in current technologies. So there is a conflict between low hardware cost and high spectral resolution. So for example, in high frequency communication, there, there is a need to have dedicated RF change, um, uh, which would lead to an increasing cost as the number of users grow. In massive MIMO um, uh, technologies, there is a huge number of antennas, each with a dedicated phase shifter. In ultra-dense networking, the dense topology requires extremely high cost of deployment and coordination. There is also another conflict between flexible network deployment and low energy consumption. So in fixed access points, those types of uh, devices, they cannot guarantee to adapt to dynamically changing user traffic. On the other hand, when we talk about moving access points, those involve high energy consumption, such as propulsion energy and transmission energy. So there is really a big expectation on a new technology that uh, can be low cost, high spectral, provide high spectral resolution that can be easily deployed and is compatible with the 6G demands um, in, terms on, uh, uh, in terms of communication and sensing. So the idea to come up and develop these type of uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces is by the fact that they provide a unique design that lies in realizing artificial structures with massive antenna arrays whose interaction with the impinging electromagnetic waves can be intentionally controlled and engineered through connected passive elements, such as phase shifters, in a way that enhances the wireless system's performance in terms of 
coverage rate and so on without the need to deploy extra um, radio frequency change. It's a matter uh, uh, radio frequency chain, uh, chain. So it's a matter of just deploying low power elements on the surface, which can be controlled individually. Uh, so to, to give a bit of background on the operational uh, and the functionalities of those reconfigurable uh, intelligence surfaces, which are designed to accommodate the needs of smart radio environments, let us consider the current wireless network. So in a current wireless network, the mobile station would like to, uh, uh, to communicate with mobile M. Um, however, there might be an object that is lying in the middle of the uh, um, of the link. And in this case, the connectivity will be hand over to another base station too to serve this mobile user. Uh, in some certain scenarios, due to some reflections, this signal might be reached to an unintended eavesdropper or uh, undesired eavesdropper causing some security leak. In another uh, circumstances, there might be an object like a glass that would cause this uh, this, uh, uh, diffraction of the signal, causing the signal to be reached to some uh, nearby mobile phones, causing interference to them. So the current situation is that the propagation environment can be considered to be out of control. What we want to do is to change this kind of wireless network from being dumb to smart. And in this case, in the conventional wireless networks, what is happening is that there is a lack of control over the propagation and the scattering of the electromagnetic waves. And in this case, the environment remains unaware of the ongoing communications, and this poses fundamental limitations for building a truly pervasive software-defined wireless network. And what is happening at the moment is that the endpoints, so either the transmitter or the receiver, their operation is jointly uh, optimized without considering what is happening in the middle, in the, in, in, in the, in the wireless channel uh, itself. So we consider now that the environment is just a passive spectator. What we want to do is to move to smart wireless networks. So in this case, we can control all of the um, uh, signals transmitted from base station one so that it can reach only to the intended receiver that is mobile M, for example. And in this case, we will say that the wireless network can be under control and it can be designed to be smart. And in order for it to be uh, smart, we need to move the radio environments from just adaptation, where only the endpoints, the operation of the endpoints, the transmitter and the receiver are optimized, into having a full programmability and control over the wireless channel where it can be also included in the joint optimization of the overall functionality. So how can this be realized? This can be done by deploying in the surrounding what is called a reconfigurable intelligence surface that is um, uh, that can be realized by having discrete elements or, uh, or antenna patches that can passively reflect the signals in a controlled mechanism. And, um, I'm not going to go into the electronics of it because there is a whole research going into how to uh, design and manufacture those ele uh, elements. But the idea over here is to move from um, conventional reflections, which are governed by the Snell's law, into generalized reflections um, uh, that can be steered in, uh, into any desired direction, uh, depending on the requirements of the receivers in, in a specific room. Um, and if we look at the evolution of meta surfaces, those kind of engineered surfaces, we see that the, uh, the surfaces have moved from passive meta surfaces, which can only reflect without any control, into active meta surfaces that has tunable uh, elements into them, into a digital meta surface that can be uh, controlled through coding mechanisms into programmable meta surfaces where uh, there's an, uh, uh, they have embedded into them the FPGA and MCU where all, each of those individual elements can uh, be uh, controlled in order to provide different interactivity with the impinging electromagnetic wave towards intelligent reflective surfaces where 
those type of um, uh, surfaces can apply machine learning algorithms to learn from the environment and adapt accordingly into a self-adaptive meta surfaces where these meta surfaces can be connected with sensors that gain, uh, that take data from the surrounding feed it into a, um, a machine learning uh, model so that it can train uh, on what is happening on the uh, on the uh, in the environment and respond to um, uh, 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 to the to the reflections accordingly. Uh, so basically, the operational principles of those types of surfaces um, uh, are based on several elements, such as reconfigurability, interconnection uh, of different layers, programmability, sensing, computing, and networking. And um, in, in in our in one of our magazine papers, an outlook uh, on the interplay of artificial intelligence and software defined meta surfaces, and an, an overview of opportunities and limitations. We have provided the details of the functionalities of uh, these elements and how machine learning can be integrated in those types of uh, of surfaces in order to accommodate different needs in, uh, for uh, that's suitable for different uh, wireless application scenarios. So the interested uh, readers can um, can refer to this magazine paper uh, in order to learn more about um, the functionalities of different elements. Um, we, we, we also uh, uh, proposed a number of potential applications in this paper. So for example, if you look at scenario A, that is at the top uh, left, you can see that the uh, met those type of meta surfaces can perform beam splitting, steering, and modulation, which can be suitable for multi-user downlink transmissions. Also, uh, if you look at scenario B at the bottom left, uh, those type of surfaces, they can perform beam reflection to assist in uh, vehicular to vehicular communication. Another uh, potential application is the top right where we see scenario C. Those type of uh, surfaces can perform beam focusing, which is suitable for wireless power transfer or to focus the signal intended to devices which harvest our uh, radio frequency energy to power uh, the, the electronics of the internal device. Another uh, scenario that is scenario D at the bottom uh, right, uh, we can see that those reflecting surfaces are able to perform beam absorption. And this is particularly interesting for physical layer security where the signal is absorbed in the direction of an eavesdropper so that it can be prevented from reaching to that um, uh, undesired um, user. So this is just a an overview of uh, some of the applications that could be uh, seen uh, when um, uh, when assisted by uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. So at the moment, the research on uh, on on these type of technologies is uh, is quite broad, and it is either relevant to the fabrication of the surface itself. And we can see at the bottom right um, the the RIS prototype um, uh, that is fabricated at our uh, CSI hub. There is a whole uh, researchers group working on the fabrication. Uh, another group around the world would be looking at the path loss and the channel modeling of communication systems assisted by RISs. There is also um, a, a very active research in the direction of um, applying channel estimation uh, mechanisms, um, uh, also performance optimization for single user, multiple user systems. There is a research uh, also on developing analytical frameworks to understand the performance uh, behavior of wireless networks assisted by RIS. And this is particularly where my research falls into. Other research studies, they are relevant to experimental validation or uh, developing um, optimization frameworks to perform resource and network management. So to provide a general overview of uh, what I currently do uh, in, the per in the perspective of performance analysis, um, I have a number of PhD uh, students and postdocs that I work on, with, that I work with in order to develop a um, mathematical uh, framework that gives us the ability or the tools uh, through coming up with closed form expressions, such as the one at the bottom over here, in order to understand the relationship between the system parameters and its behavior. So in this study, what we look at is 
what would be the bit error rate performance of a system assisted by RIS uh, in generalized Gaussian noise. So lots of studies, they just take into the consideration the simple, the, the simple Gaussian uh, noise consideration. However, in practical uh, conditions, such as in, the, in industrial environments, the noise is not necessarily always Gaussian. Uh, sometimes it could be either um, relevant to gamma noise, Laplacian noise, um, that can reflect uh, more practical considerations. So in this study, we uh, developed a closed form expression. I did not include the whole uh, mathematical steps not to, so that not to bore you in order to, um, uh, to help us uh, graph the behavior of the system uh, under different uh, scenarios or under different conditions. So what we see is that as we increase the number of the used elements, the, uh, the bit error rate performance really decreased massively. But what is important that this type of study gives us an understanding of the design so that if we say that we want the transmit power to be at this particular uh, setting, what this study can help us is to understand what is the minimum number of elements required in order to reach to a desired uh, bit error rate performance under different noise uh, conditions. Uh, similarly, another uh, study is to uh, develop a framework that help us understand the time needed to charge a battery of a, of a, uh, of a battery limited energy, uh, RF energy harvester. So over here, the RIS is used to focus the signal into an energy harvester and this energy um, uh, harvesting receiver re relies on the radio frequency uh, power received from uh, the RIS. So this mathematical um, uh, uh, framework help us understand the probability uh, of the time needed to charge the battery of such devices and how much elements are needed in order to charge the battery under different fading conditions. So we take into consideration different uh, channel fading conditions and we understand what is the effect of the uh, battery type, uh, the number of elements, the transmit power on the uh, likelihood that the battery of the device would charge in a specific amount of time, which is needed to design this type of networks. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I'm going to skip this work. Uh, we have another work relevant to, uh, to the performance analysis of RIS assisted UAV networks. And this, in this uh, work, we consider that the, um, that the link between the base station and the UAV is supported by RIS. And we also develop a, th a mathematical representation to understand the behavior and what is the effect of changing some uh, design parameters on the performance limits of the system, such as the outage probability. So we take into consideration the effect of the UAV height, the number of element, the distance between different nodes, and so on. So uh, interested re readers can have a look at our visionary IEEE magazine articles. Uh, we have three of them. Uh, the middle one, the Li-Fi through reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. In this one, we um, uh, we envision that the surfaces um, uh, are reflecting light uh, um, uh, signals in order to provide uh, communications through visible light communication. And it is one of our highly uh, read articles. Uh, I have also uh, co-edited a book and written uh, a book chapter on this particular topic. Uh, so to conclude, we, we, we can see that the RIS assisted communications are attractive in promoting green energy efficient communications because uh, they do not, um, they operate on very low um, uh, uh, power and uh, the modeling and characterization of RIS assisted network is really useful for understanding the limitations of the network under different setups. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for listening and you can reach me through my email or my LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, if you would like to collaborate, I'd be more than happy to discuss any uh, potential collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lin. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Yeah, we have you. you have two questions for you here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the first one is uh, how RIS can be different in mechanism or a trade-off with the serial beam forming? Okay, so if I understood the question uh, uh, correctly, um, is that, so the RIS 
uh, we can we can deploy beamforming within the RIS. So in this case, the, the beamforming will be designed at the base station, and it will help in steering the signals from the base station to the RIS. Then what we need to do is to optimize the reflection coefficients of the RIS in order to reflect them into desired uh, uh, users. Um, so what is happening is that we use the same mechanisms of beamforming, but we take into consideration now the reflection coefficients at the at the RIS. Uh, so what what is different is that we are controlling the links from the base station to the RIS and then from the RIS to the users in cases where there is no direct link between the base station and and the users. Okay, thank you. And uh, the uh, second question is about. Uh, and in one of your slides, you show the mobile app with some problems, different scenarios. And the question is, when a mobile app is continuously in mobility, how RIS can be tracking its, its location and what will be the limitation for it? Is there any challenges associated with it? Right. So uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, indeed, in my scenario, I have just put a general uh, mobile M, which could be either fixed uh, or, or, uh, or dynamic. And there is a whole group of research that is working on um, uh, user tracking and localization through RIS. Uh, this is not part of my research particularly, but um, uh, uh, but I, I, I'm aware that there is a, um, a big research uh, interest in using RIS for tracking and localization. So um, uh, maybe interested um, uh, readers can have a look at those studies because in these, it is, it is a challenge to, to do the localization and also accommodating uh, the user uh, serving it while having accurate uh, um, uh, information. I think yeah. for the sake of the time, uh, Lena, if you kindly answer, you, you, you've got access here. Yeah? So if you kindly yes. answer yes, the rest sure. of the questions and we will move on. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you very much. Back to you, Yingli. I'm I'll answer the questions individually. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's invite our third speakers. Uh it's Paul Poria Bolotta. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD thesis. The title is Advanced Control Strategies for Fifth Generation Desiccating and Cooling Networks. Uh, I started my PhD uh, in October 2020 in the University of Bergamo. Uh, my master and my bachelor uh, was in power system, and uh, I was involved in, in the field of energy management system and energy efficiency with the main focus on demand response strategies in uh, smart buildings. Well, uh, what is distributing and cooling networks? Distributing and cooling networks, uh, it's a sustainable technologies that is able to, uh, that is able to uh, cover both heating and cooling loads in the building, especially in the urban areas. If you look at this picture, you can see that from the first generation of a distributing cooling network to the fifth generation, uh, the temperature level of the water from around 200 degrees Celsius decreased to around 5 to 25 degrees C. And uh, simultaneously, the energy efficiency has been uh, increasing. The thing that is important is that uh, the role of uh, the role of the, the consumption of the uh, fossil fuel from the first generation to fifth generation, has been decreased. This is the uh, somehow the, the main thing that somehow we are tracking in the field of uh, sustainable technologies. 
if you look at the uh, layout of the fifth generation uh, district in cooling network, you can see that uh, we are dealing with the cold pipe and the warm pipe. pipe. And as I told you, uh, in, in the fifth generation district in cooling network, we, we don't have a, a water with a, a high level temperature in the network. Because generally, we can say that the fifth generation district heating cooling network is a thermal energy supplying grid that uses uh, warm water or brine as a career medium uh, with decentralized substation with water heats, uh, water, uh, water source heat pumps. If you look at this uh, configuration, you can see that, for example, we have a supermarket, which means that we are able to uh, use the waste heat of the supermarket or any kinds of, for example, the factories, we are able to reuse the uh, waste, uh, the waste heat. The thing in the building is that we have a substation here which contain heat pump, uh, domestic hot water, thermal energy storage, or the other things. The uh, most important component here is heat pump heat pump uh, actually is a component that consume electricity and is able to slate uh, the temperature of the uh, the water so uh, the main question can be that how a high level controller can be designed for managing decentralized substation in this uh, specific networks and the thing that I highlighted is that which type of uh, controller based on model predictive controller, uh, model predictive control, which means that we are trying to apply model predictive control for our uh, project. But what is the model predictive control? For example, uh, in our daily life, imagine we are able, uh, we, we would like to fill this tank. This is a tank and we would like to fill this with water. If we consider the target is here, at the beginning, we don't care that how much is the, uh, how much is uh, the mass flow rate. And we only uh, open, uh, we only turn turn on the, uh, the tab and uh, we don't care about uh, the time or the other thing at the beginning. But the thing is that during the time, as we see that uh, the level of the tank is closing to the target, so uh, we, uh, based on our anticipation that we say, we will say that, okay, maybe uh, now is the time that we should control the tab. So we start to controlling the tab to reach the level of the target. So based on our anticipation, we make some decisions. This is the main concept of model predictive control. As I uh, told you, since uh, model predictive control uh, works based on the prediction, we can see that uh, our methodology at the, at the first stage, uh, we would like to develop some reduced order model based on uh, artificial neural networks. For example, for uh, for thermal load prediction of the buildings or the weather forecast or the many things, for all of them, we need a reduced order model. The next step is that we would like to apply uh, an optimization algorithm to, the to our model to optimize uh, the model. And finally, we would like to uh, test our model uh, in the in the laboratory you know, under close to the reality boundary condition. This is, for example, uh, a preliminary result for thermal load prediction ba based on artificial neural network. As you can see here uh, in the uh, second box, for example, this is our prediction uh, for for the temperature of the living room in the, in the building. Uh, every one hour, we have a prediction for next 24 hour. And this is the prediction for the thermal load. Based on the KPIs that we considered, uh, this model uh, suits us. So we are going to use this model. And finally, in my project, uh, the expected result can be that, for example, a library for reduced order models training and validation uh, in Python. 
uh, validated reduced order model of the main components like heat pump and thermal energy storage. The model predictive control platform for uh, the real time optimization and also performance assessment, uh, assist, uh, assessment uh, with respect to the traditional control. And finally, we would like to implement this controller in the uh, real life, in the uh, real world. Yes, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any kinds of question, please ask me. Thank you, Borja. If you have any questions, you can just type in our Q&A section. Mm, yeah, uh, here we have a question for you, Borja. Uh, okay. How can we use water in the range of uh, 15 to 25 degrees C for your heating purposes? Yes, uh, as I uh, mentioned you, the thing that uh, plays a wider role in fifth generation desiccating cooling network is heat pump. Heat pump uh, is a component, is a machine that is able to display the temperature of water. So uh, at the beginning, uh, only we need to, for example, extract water, uh, groundwater and feed the uh, heat pump and heat pump is able to uh, consume electricity and escalate the temperature. So, for example, uh, it's it's completely depends on uh, the type of the machine. But for example, we can feed the uh, water with temperature around twenty degrees C and receive uh, the temperature with the uh, seventy or eighty degrees C. So this is the main thing uh, about uh, this specific generation. Okay, thank you. And another question is about uh, the um, uh, MPC, the model product control you mentioned. So what's your plan for implementing this controller in the real world? Yeah, the thing is that uh, here, uh, currently we are developing this controller, but uh, the next phase, we would like to implement this in our demo case in Milan. So this is uh, our plan to implement in the real world, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you Let so much. Let me check if there are any more questions. Yep. Another question is, uh, uh, would this system be placed in a specific area, like for gathering certain water or something else? Uh, it depends, you know, it depends. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the final speaker, Dr. Nada Azmir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank the organizer for organizing this event. Um, I'm sharing just my screen. Yeah. Okay, for well now. Thank you very much. So my name is Neda Azameh, and uh, I will be talking about uh, automated echocardiogram uh, image interpretation uh, using uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, very recently, University of West London as a lecturer in computer science. Uh, previously, I was working as a postdoc uh, at the University of Sheffield, where I was working on an AI uh, in uh, aura dysplasia grading project. Uh, and I did my PhD in computer science, focusing on AI at University of Lincoln, collaboration with Imperial College London. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will just start with a brief introduction uh, that what is the importance of this research, and then I will talk about the advances in AI that how these AIs uh, can help to develop automated models for uh, echocardiography image interpretations, uh, which is considering three different uh, basically studies. And then I will wrap up with some conclusion. Um, ischemic uh, heart disease and uh, a stroke, basically they have remained uh, the leading cause of global mortalities uh, consistently in the last few years. 
So if we can detect uh, basically these uh, anomalies uh, in the heart at the earliest stages, uh, that would be uh, very helpful for reduction in mortalities and also uh, obviously effective treatment. Um, also, evaluation of a heart Are you motion. Moving your slides. Uh, no, I didn't move my slides. I'm in the introduction. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. And evaluation of the heart motion has a significant role in the quantifying some clinical measurements, uh, which basically help clinicians to differentiate between healthy and uh, unhealthy hearts. Um, let's say, uh, for example, our doctor concerned uh, that uh, we may have uh, suffering from a heart disease. Uh, so the doctor, uh, to order the assess, basically the condition, they order echocardiographic examinations uh, to uh, basically evaluate the condition of the heart, which uh, this job is going to be using by uh, the non-invasive technique, which is the ultrasound a scan to look at the heart and also nearby uh, blood vessels. Uh, so ultrasound machine uh, basically transmit uh, the sound frequency uh, pulse wave by using a transducer. By Dr. To the, to Nada, the heart. sorry, yes. Dr. Nada, we can't see the slide. If you just please share your screen again, thank you. Really? Okay. So can you see now the cardiographic examination slides? I can see the, the PowerPoint if you just share it. Just put it like full. Okay. Um, now, now we can, yes, thank you. Thank you. So I can see an error zoom. Uh, was... Yes, we can see now. No. I think we lost her. Maybe she will rejoin. Hello, Nathan, we cannot hear you. Yeah, I'm making another co-host so she can join. Excuse me, I lost the connection. Can you hear me? Ah, it's okay, okay now. All right. Come I don't back. know what's going on. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I'm sharing my screen again, and I'm in echocardiographic examination slide. Can you just please confirm that you're seeing the slides? Yes. Yeah. And you're seeing the echocardiographic examination slide, right? Yeah. Perfect, fine. Um, yeah, I was talking about uh, basically the ultrasound machine uh, transmit uh, the sound uh, pulses into a heart by uh, using uh, a transducers. Uh, and the sounds travel to a heart, hit a boundary between tissues, and then they get reflected back uh, to a machine. And at the end, machine will display this complicated image, which is an image of the heart, uh, has a four chamber, and they are separating by a wall. Uh, these white dots in echo images are called the speckles, uh, and uh, there are different stages need to be followed in order to interpret uh, these echo images. And uh, we are using AI to be ordered to implement some of these uh, stages. Uh, the first stage is echo view identifications. Uh, basically, when the transducers sample the heart, it's going to sample from different viewpoints. And uh, they need basically uh, to know what, what's that view. So in order to automate that echo view identification by AI, uh, so it's, it's a very challenging problem. Um, and it, it requires a specialized training. And uh, basically, when the doctors want to identify that, it's very prone to inter and intra-observer variabilities. 
And uh, obviously, if you can see the images, these are 14 different sample of echo views uh, of our data sets, uh, which you can see that they are very similar. So it's gonna be challenging for an operator to successfully identify them. Plus there is a background noise. Um, so as you familiar with the deep learning, you know that the convolutional neural networks are effective at learning features uh, from digital images. However, uh, designing an architecture, uh, basically is something similar to UNET is very time consuming. Um, and it's very complicated. And uh, also most of these design architectures are very dependent on the particular data set uh, that used during the design process. So in order to automate that, in order to automate uh, designing an architecture for a customized data set, we utilized um, a NAS methodology, neural architecture search technique, particularly DARTs uh, to design a neural network from a scratch for our echo view identifications. Uh, just a little bit about the techniques. Uh, given the input image, the first stage is the architecture search, uh, which is include a cell, uh, which is a sequence of several nodes. Each node represents of a feature map, and each uh, edge is represent of uh, basically a single operation or a combination of operation like convolution, max pooling, or ReLU. And we give the parameters to each edges, which represent of how much we weight each operation. And at the end of the search, uh, it drops the weak connection uh, and it keeps the single choice of the option with the highest uh, probabilities. Uh, this is our the best cell that is found for our echo view data sets. Uh, and then we design the network from a scratch um, and the weights that we learn it during the search stage are discarded. And then we train the network from a, uh, from a scratch. Basically a network, it could be a cell or a stack of uh, cells. Just a little bit about our experimental results. Uh, these, you can see clearly these points are echo view uh, from our test data set. And the model clearly not only has basically group similar images, but has only group similar views, which we highlighted with the background, uh, different background colors. We also studied the effect of different uh, portion of training sizes on classification accuracies. And uh, you can see that our proposed model uh, is performing better uh, with the less training data. And similarly, we also studied uh, the different input image sizes, how it affects on uh, the classification accuracy. Uh, moving to another stage of uh, basically echocardiographic image interpretation, uh, we also automated uh, basically left ventricular segmentation. This image is an example of uh, the basically these two borders are a boundary around left ventricles, and this is from annotation from two different operators for our data sets. And uh, similar to these borders can basically give some clinical measurements, important clinical measurements uh, for clinical people to differentiate between healthy and unhealthy hearts. Similar to a previous project, which was echo view identification, this is also very challenging. Uh, even if we automate it by AI, it still is a very challenging process because uh, always there is a background noise and there are images that they have a low qualities. Uh, we again focus on a neural architecture search method, uh, auto deep lab particularly. I'm not going to the detail of the uh, models, but uh, apart from the search cell that I explained earlier, uh, for this basically network, we also search at the network level apart from a cell search. And then we uh, got the best network for our customized data set. Uh, but for search, we use a very well-known uh, particular data set is called KMS data set. And then we got this network. Then uh, a little bit about our result, we basically trained our KMS data set by using uh, this achieved network from the NAS, which you can see that is outperforming, uh, is compared with the UNES or other established uh, networks. Interestingly, we got this basically um, network that we train it from a public data set. Then uh, we sorry, search it from the public data set. So we train our two private data sets. 
Um, and we can see that uh, also our proposed model is performing better in compared with the established model. Moving to the last part of uh, automation of uh, echo image interpretations, uh, we also did some work on uh, strain imaging or uh, is also known as a speckle tracking. As I said earlier, these uh, white dots in echo images are called speckles. And uh, tracking uh, these speckles frame by frame uh, will allow extraction of some clinical measurements. Uh, and uh, which in here we are focusing on displacement uh, is a very challenging task because of high level of the noise in these echo images. And although there are commercially speaker tracking software packages are available in, in an industry, but the measurement they provide are uh, usually mutually inconsistent. Uh, so we first did a, a standard block matching approach, um, which I'm going to explain briefly. This blue square shows uh, an identified speckle pattern known as a kernel, and we can track uh, basically this identified kernel within a searching window in the next frame. And uh, within a searching window, a block can be compared with the old possible block of the same direction with the basically sum square differences. Uh, to find our best candidate. And our best candidate is basically lowest uh, SSD value, which indicates uh, the most possible direction of movement of the tissue uh, where it's moved from one frame to another frames. Uh, then we try to optimize these uh, standard block matching algorithms uh, but for a neighborhood of a kernel with a smoothness uh, basically constraint to minimize uh, these cost functions, uh, which the first component is a sum of our SSD value, which I explained earlier, lambda is a regularization weight, and the second component is uh, basically is a penalty functions. Um, so the more details of the model can be found uh, in our papers. And just a little bit about the result, uh, we basically evaluated our um, the proposed model of the iterative uh, speckle tracking, tracking and also standard block matching for ischemic and healthy heart. Um, uh, and we compare it with the ground rules for several major manufacturers, Toshiba, Siemens, et cetera, for, by using a synthetic uh, public data set. And clearly you can see that the proposed model uh, is performing better in compare with the standard uh, block matching algorithms. Um, as a conclusion, I would say that these uh, proposed techniques, uh, basically because they are evaluated on a different private and public data set, and you can see that they are outperforming in compared to the state of the art results. And um, these uh, are just the, what I present are three stages of uh, automatic, uh, basically image, uh, echocardiography image interpretation that can contribute to clinical practice and research. But I see there are other uh, stages of um, these um, echocardiography image interpretations uh, that is uh, basically other our PhD students are working on these projects. Um, one of the things there is a still room for improvement and obviously I used uh, a supervised learning approach and to reduce, which is very expensive in terms of the cost of annotations, an important direction that needs to be examined is a self-supervised or semi-supervised learning approach, uh, which at the moment currently our PhD student in our uh, in-staff group are, are working on these different uh, kind of projects. Uh, if you are, have an interest about our research or if you would like to collaborate, uh, feel free to check our website, Insta Research Group, uh, that founded by Professor Masu Zorgarni, and please free, feel free to contact uh, him or myself. And um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Neda. Thank you for your great presentation. So if we would, our attendees have any problems, you can just drop it in our work and HF. Mm -hmm. Here is the uh, first question for you, Ned. Uh, are these projects that you talked uh, can be used in clinical settings? Uh, yes and no. 
Uh, yes, it can be used uh, in a in clinical setting, some part of uh, basically the project. Obviously, uh, for example, the model that is implemented uh, by for echo view identifications, um, it can basically take the model and we can test it uh, on our clinical data. Uh, but we need a user interface uh, to do that, which uh, currently our PhD student uh, in our Insta group are working on this to be able to improve it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, would this method fully replace tumor annotation or would that doctor still be required to verify the output from it? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, basically these, what I presented about these three different studies, they are basically uh, work based on annotations. So we train all these models by provided annotation from our cardiologist. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because of the limited, limited time, yeah, we will just uh, uh, stop here with all the talk. So let me share my screen. You know that kindly, if you answer the question for you, the time yeah. answer. Yeah, sure. Same question and answer, thank you. Yeah, sure, I will answer. Let me just check it. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, dear attendees, hope you all enjoyed today's talk. And uh, please share your feedback with us. Just by scanning this QR code here, it will only take around two minutes and uh, your support will be greatly appreciated. And please also don't forget to provide your email address in the form and we will send you your e-certificate. Next, let's invite uh, Dr. Nakam Sai to share some uh, I IEEE Women in, Engineer Women in Engineering Awards opportunities and also close the webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Ying. Please, if you share the link on the chat and, the, uh, and also if you make your screen full so they can um, scan the code. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would like to thank our speakers, the final year PhD students, Jana from University of Cambridge, Dr. Lena from University of Glasgow, PhD student Boya from University of Bergamo, and Dr. Nada from University of West London. I would like to thank IEEE United Kingdom and Ireland section, IEEE Region 8, IEEE Women in Engineering, the Department of IEEE at UCL, and the IIOT Research Group at the University of West London for sponsoring and promoting our events. We are grateful to all our sponsors, speakers, and attendees. I would like to thank Dr. Ying Lee, one of our steering committee members for her help in organizing this event. We will continue calling for women in engineering and computing to give a technical, inspirational and empowering session. The next early career talk event will be in June. The event digital flyer will be announced soon, so please keep your eye on the e-notice. Additionally, we are planning for the 2023 IEEE Women in Engineering United Kingdom and Ireland Awards this year. It will happen in June, hopefully. Uh, and we've got four awards. The first one is the Excellence in Engineering, this award of excellence to promote women in engineering across our geographical region. The second one is Change, a Catalyst for Equal Engineering. This award will be awarded to a person who is working towards driving change in quality processes in engineering and computing in their organization. The third one is IEEE Women in Engineering UK and IK McNulty Award. This award of excellence will be awarded to a person who could demonstrate his or her potential in the technical field in their early career, five years or less. 
The last one is the Inspirational Volunteer Award. This one will be given to a community volunteer who promotes engineering and engineering related fields with particular emphasis of encouraging girls and women to begin or remain in the field of engineering or related field. So I encourage everyone who's IEEE member uh, and matching the criteria to apply. With this said, I would like to thank everyone and end this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Speakers, Thank you if you much. stay behind for a group photo.